Hi, and welcome back. So in this new review that was published in Cell Metabolism, three renowned aging researchers, those being David Sinclair, Leonard Garanti, and Guido Cromer, summarized the current situation in human trials of potentially geroprotective drugs. They focused on eight categories, those being metformin, NAD in the sirtuins, GLP-1, rapamycin, spermidine, senolytics, probiotics, and anti-inflammatories. After providing a brief overview of the related compounds and their mechanisms of action, the authors delved into past and more importantly, ongoing human trials. Well, I hope you agree that the biology of aging is an exciting new field, but most of its success in the past has been in animal models, from early breakthroughs in yeast and worms to the robust findings by the ITP, that's the Intervention Testing Program in mice. Human data, however, is much scarcer. Some potentially geroprotective interventions, such as cellular pre-programming, are brand new, so they are yet to be tested in clinical trials. Others are well-known drugs that have been used for various indications, and there is reason to believe that they might also help prolong human lifespan. First on the trio's list is metformin. This was isolated decades ago from the French lilac, and it's a traditional anti-diabetes medication. However, it's only been widely used since the 1990s, but that said, to great success. Interestingly, it remains unclear how exactly metformin helps diabetes patients. But the leading theory is that it weakly inhibits mitochondrial respiratory complex I, which, via the activation of AMPK, lowers glucose production and stimulates mitochondrial activity. However, other explanations have also been put forward. Metformin popped into the geosciences radar after a 2014 study showing that diabetic patients on metformin tended to live longer than age-matched healthy people. A recent 2023 study questions this assumption, but the authors interpret its results as less than a death blow to metformin's prospects as a geroprotective drug. So far, in human trials, metformin has been shown to protect heart function in diabetics, improve immune function, albeit in a small-scale trial, and lower one marker of inflammation, CRP, but unfortunately not another marker, which is IL-6. The authors also note that metformin slightly dampens the effects of aerobic exercise, probably due to the attenuation of mitochondrial function. However, it's not clear at this point whether it should be seen as a serious problem for those people who exercise a lot or indeed professional athletes. Then we move on to NAD and the sirtuins. NAD is an abundant and a multi-purpose molecule that mediates energy production and serves as a substrate for the family of enzymes called the sirtuins. The sirtuins play vital roles in the body, including DNA repair and mitochondrial maintenance, and their activation has been shown to extend lifespan in numerous animal models. In addition to NAD supplementation, some sirtuins can be activated directly by compounds such as resveratrol, quercetin, and fisetin. Human trials on the NAD precursors NMN and NR have shown that those can reliably elevate NAD levels. One NMN trial in humans led to higher physical performance and a lower biological age in middle-aged adults. Two trials of the CERT-1 activator, terosterbine, demonstrated improved liver function. MIB626, an NMN polymorph developed by the company Metro Biotech, was found to improve the lipid profile and diastolic blood pressures. NR trials in patients with Parkinson's, Alzheimer's or ALS have shown some promise and many more trials are currently running. They then cover GLP-1. GLP-1 is a hormone produced in response to food intake and it's known to stimulate insulin secretion and also to mediate satiety. GLP-1 receptor antagonists such as semiglutide and terzepatide are novel anti-diabetes drugs that have become very popular lately due to their impressive effectiveness in promoting weight loss. Since diabetes and obesity are strongly associated with one another and various diseases of aging, GLP-1R antagonists have the potential to be highly effective anti-aging agents. Accordingly, two large trials showed that semaglutide and liraglutide improved cardiovascular function and decreased cardiovascular mortality. Two other studies demonstrated some positive effects of GLP-1R antagonists in Parkinson's patients. 
The trio then move on to discuss rapamycin and mTOR. Rapamycin is another FDA-approved medication that's been around for many, many years. It's mostly used as an immunosuppressant, but it also has been found to extend lifespan and health span in various animal models, including mice, even when it's given to them later in life. Rapamycin works by inhibiting the mTOR pathway, a protein complex that mediates protein production and also cell growth. Studies of emerolimus, a rapamycin analogue, showed increased immune response to the influenza vaccination and lowered infection rates over a one-year period, which is somewhat surprising given that rapamycin is an immune suppressant. The authors also suggest that this rapamycin analogue, which selectively targets only one of the mTOR components, TORC1, might be less toxic. Rapamycin has also been shown to produce a subset of pro-inflammatory T-cells in lupus and to also cause some skin rejuvenation. The authors, however, emphasise rapamycin's possible side effects. By slowing protein synthesis, rapamycin possibly blunts the effects of exercise and slows wound healing, among other things. Just like metformin, rapamycin may be ill-advised for people who have high levels of physical activity, although this still has to be proven. The next molecule they discuss is spermidine. This is a natural metabolite of the polymene family. It's been found to increase lifespan in animal models, including mice, albeit modestly when compared to rapamycin. Spermidine is known to induce autophagy, the process of clearing out accumulated cellular junk, such as misfolded proteins. Now, since autophagy targets protein aggregates, including amyloid beta, spermidine has been tested for possible cognitive functions and was shown to improve cortical thickness and hippocampal volume in older adults. Two other studies also demonstrated cognitive improvements. Spermidine is found in food, so population studies are also possible. Two retrospective studies from Italy and Austria reported inverse correlation between spermidine intake and mortality. They then move on to senolytics. These are a completely new class of drug that really didn't exist only a few years ago. Senolytics are believed to clear out senescent or zombie cells. These are cells that become dysfunctional and stop proliferating, but remain in the body, causing inflammation and all other types of harm. Despite the amount of interest in senolytics, both in academia and in the private sector, completed human trials are still very sparse. In the paper, the authors tend to mention just those senolytics that have shown the ability to clear out senescent cells. However, many trials are still underway, so stay tuned. The penultimate subject they cover is probiotics. Again, the importance of the microbiome in aging is still a relatively new finding. Studies have shown that aging changes gut microbiota composition and that transplanting young microbiota confers various health benefits and can increase lifespan in mice. Probiotics have been demonstrated to improve immune function, increasing the number of T cells and lowering the number and the duration of common infectious diseases. Several studies have reported that a healthier microbiome can also improve some cancer outcomes. Beneficial bacteria can also improve lipid profiles and increase insulin sensitivity. Probiotics can also lower inflammation and improve cognitive function. Sticking with inflammation, since chronic inflammation is one of the hallmarks of aging, the formidable arsenal of anti-inflammatory drugs, including steroids, analgesics and monoclonal antibodies against particular inflammatory molecules, has considerable anti-aging potential. Most of the completed trials, according to the authors, deal with the inflammatory cytokine IL-6. Reducing IL-6 levels has been shown to improve symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome and ulcerative colitis. The authors, however, warn against tinkering with inflammatory cytokines since those mediate immune responses. One study reported that treatment with an IL-6 neutralizing antibody actually led to an increase in infections. Among other anti-inflammatories, the good old aspirin is featured in several ongoing trials, including the prevention of cancer in at-risk patients. And if you'd like to learn more about each of the supplements I've mentioned, look at my supplement stack in the description below. Each item has a link to a more detailed video. 
And if you're looking for a reputable supplier to buy these supplements from, please check out the big three, Renew by Science, Do Not Age, and Pro Health Longevity. And if you do buy from one of these, please feel free to use the code MYNMN at checkout to get between a 10 and a 15% discount. So I hope you found that interesting or informative, hopefully both. From that list, I do currently take aspirin, metformin, the senolytics, quercetin and fisetin. And although they talk about MIB626, the NMN polymorph, I still take the original NMN. Let me know in the comments below what you take from that list or what you think you may take in the future. 